Hello, and welcome to The Confident Commit, the podcast for anyone who wants to join the conversation on how to deliver software better and faster. If you're looking to build a toast and chip, tune in less confidently commit. Listening to season three, we're talking all about great teams. I'm your host, Rob Zuber, CTO of Circle CI, the industry leader in all things CI and CD. Today, I'm joined by Matt DeBurgalis, CTO and co founder of Apollo GraphQL. Matt, thanks for joining me. Totally. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And uh, as I just discussed, coming at us from the garage, I'm excited about that. Um, I think it's like very, like very comfortable looking space. I hope you're, hope you're comfortable. Anyway, uh, co-founder. So that, I mean, from a team perspective, that's always really exciting to me. I, you know, I've done a bunch of startups. I've done very small, grown, and then I've worked in large orgs. And so um, I think that the, you know, the whole growth cycle, kind of how you bring in your perspective, build your perspective, grow a culture around that. Like there's so much to explore about continuing to be great, you know, as you go through that transition. Um, of course, that's all founded on the assumption that, you know, you, you have a great team, but I'm going to work from that assumption. Um, and that you have some ideas about how to make that happen as we grow. So excited to hear about that. And then we'll also talk about kind of where that came from, um, et cetera. But just to get it, I mean, I think a lot of people know who Apollo is, but you can never, never be totally sure. So why don't you give us just a couple quick seconds on um, Apollo, what it is you're trying to achieve, and a little bit about, you know, what, what's the journey so far, just from an overall org and team perspective? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're the GraphQL company. There's this shift that uh, developers who make products have gone through from traditional point-to-point APIs, REST APIs for the most part, to this idea of a graph. And for the developer, it's night and day. It's it's used to write code to connect your screens to your cloud services. And over the last 10 years, you've found yourself with a lot of cloud services and a lot of APIs to talk to. Mm-hmm. And instead of that, uh, the graph lets you write a query. It's a lot like SQL, except for apps. Um, there's a story for devs that's about great tooling not only writing less code, but strong typing in your UI and just all kinds of affordances that make it a more high quality app and a, and a better you know experience building it. There's also a story and it, it connects to a lot of what I think about with uh, team building and organizing engineering efforts around mm-hmm. allowing you to have more of an agile approach to your product roadmap, allowing you not just to ship faster, but to be more adaptable to changing markets or changing circumstances for the company. So for me, um, a lot of my thinking on team building actually ties pretty closely to how we think about technical architecture and vice versa when we bring Apollo into a a company. And as an example, if you go to walmart.com, that's all Apollo under the hood. Um, the, The story we hear is people adopt this stuff as much for social reasons around how they want to organize their teams as they do for the technical reasons that drive the initial shift away from APIs toward the, toward the graph. Yeah. I I love it. I mean, you're not the first to connect architecture and system design to, you know, organizing and the kind of, it's a two way street, right? Oh, I want to get to this organization. So here's how I need to think about architecture. I want to get to this architecture. Here's how I need to think about organization. Is there a, like a concrete, kind of example or a way that you would describe that organizational philosophy that you think is really supported by making the shift towards um, GraphQL? I think it's a really interesting intersection. Yeah. There's, you know, you see this at a lot of different layers of the stack. It's it's the move toward composition and having a, a modular architecture. So, mm-hmm. you know, Kubernetes is this for cloud native where Kubernetes means you can let multiple teams work side by side without stepping on each other's toes. I know that's a ludicrous simplification, but at some level like that, that's what containerization and then orchestration got us. Uh, Mm -hmm. You see it in the UI. I mean, that's what react is. And in fact, Facebook built react specifically so that whatever it was a thousand, you know, UI developers could collaborate on a unified user experience but working in parallel and again, not stepping on each other's mm-hmm. toes, right? And in, in the old days of mm-hmm. jQuery, you put two components built, I mean, call them a component, but you, 
you put two things built by two teams on the same screen and nothing works. The yeah. whole idea is you, you need a story for that. So that's what graph is for your, your middle layer, for your APIs. If, if you think about APIs traditionally, you can't, you can't mess with someone else's API. You have no idea what it means to change mm-hmm. a REST payload. Uh, that means you can't compose them. You can't test them in isolation, but then use them together in novel combinations. And, you know, one example of this is think about M&A. You, you have all these examples of mm. companies that had an architecture, but then acquired a, an adjacent company or a complementary business. And the whole point is some kind of synergy between the two. But you really need a strategy for how you can take advantage of moments like that. And, and so you end up with this story across all these parts of the stack of, and you said it, how do I get composability, but in an incremental way where I, I don't want to have to rewrite my whole stack or my whole app to get there. That's never going to work anymore. But day by day, I can move closer to this vision of having a foundation for um, not just shipping products, but an unknown tomorrow. You know, one way I think about it is I think the VPN's job is one of the hardest in the building because you're under all this pressure to ship and there's all kinds of things you might do to ship faster, but then you're also accountable for this longer term sort of positioning, right? Where imagine what it was like at a media company the day that Apple News got announced. They had no warning. But suddenly mm-hmm. you need a new strategy for how you're going to be there. Or imagine what it was like when Alexa came out and everybody needed a voice strategy or everybody wants a, an ML strategy now to integrate into the product. So somehow the engineering team needs to be set up to go faster than the competition, but also preserve flexibility so that you can react faster to something changing. And um, I, I think this trend toward modularity and then what that means for team design and responsibility and how you organize teams is is uh one of the most interesting ones i've seen well that i think that's very true and it it, it leads to a really interesting connection so if we go back right it's sort of mentioned being a founder you know you've been doing apollo for a long time um and i think startups inherently are good at what you're describing because you have no idea if your business is even makes any sense, right? So, so of course you're super adaptable. There's a couple people and you're throwing ideas at the wall and you're, you know, you're kind of constantly changing, but then, you know, you build, right? You find something that's working, you build on top of that. uh, And it feels like it's all going really well at a much larger scale. And then, you know, some, something significant shifts in the market. So um, tell me a little bit about that, I guess that growth and what it is that you've done or how you think about, you know, growing and scaling the organization, but maintaining that agility that you're just describing. Like you're not coming into a Walmart and saying, okay, now you need to rethink, right? You're not transitioning from one way of doing it to another way, but kind of growing up as a small company and trying to maintain that sort of sense of agility. How do you, how do you think about that? And how do you, how do you make sure that you build a team that maintains that? I mean, I think this is the hard work every day, and I don't have any magic answers here. One thing we have found that is essential for us is getting engineering as close as possible to the customer. And and I'll give you a couple examples. So we're an open source company, and I love open source. It has a lot of technical advantages. It's, It's kind of my heritage just growing up and getting into software development. It's definitely the right way to build infra, I think, in in this day and age. One challenge you run into, though, is open source users aren't the same as customers. And we found it very challenging early on. We were close to our users, but when you see a bunch of pull requests coming in and you can't connect that to something economic, it can be very disorienting. And, you know, one one piece of advice I've given to anybody that's getting into the open source space or building a dev tool is... Get, get to paying customers as soon as you can, not for the revenue advantages or, or any of the go-to-market piece of it, but as an engineering leader, I find it gets really magical when you're able to build teams that have some close connection to a paying customer in a use case. 
And, you know, we certainly hire for that. Like you, you want people who are excited to spend time with customers and, uh, you know, part of that's just a genuine curiosity and part of that's about care for others. And, you know, you can take it in a lot of directions, but I think a lot of, you know, if you, if you empower teams, but give them the right North star, or I should say, and give them the right North star with a customer, a lot of the other stuff I find falls into place. The other one I found, and this really came from the, you know, just the experience of doing this for a while is it sounds trite, but I think it boils down to great leaders. We've been through some pivots and some um, chapters of Apollo where it's, it's, it's not that we weren't sure, Rob, it's that we were sure it wasn't the right product. And we were, <laughs> we were sure that we had to do something different. And at the end mm-hmm. of the day, I think the only way you get from here to there with a team is with um, leadership that's committed to helping bring the team along. And I'll be honest, I, I don't know how to teach that. That's what you have to find in people. And mm-hmm. we we think really carefully about that because I, I think for any startup, you kind of only get so many swings of the bat. Every time you hire somebody, you, you need you need those people to grow into the leaders to to be the the kind of the innovative force and the cultural anchor for the company, especially at scale. And I, I think if I look back on, you know, for example, how I spent my time early on, the time I spent on leadership development or hiring for that had a much higher ROI than maybe time spent on architectural choices or, I mean, they're both important, but it turns mm-hmm. out, I think, you know, one is necessary and the other one um, often follows from the first. And you've raised, you know, you've raised hiring a bunch in there um as as a topic right in in building out a good team how much of that is sort of what folks are bringing to the table how much of it is the potential and what you believe you can grow in those folks and then i guess how do you invest in in the latter that's probably a lot of questions in one but how, i guess what's the trade off between this is sort of a, this person's already going to come in and lead versus I, I'm going to grow them into a leader. I see that potential. And, and for the latter, how do you invest in that? It's, it's a conversation we've had a lot. One of the challenges of a startup is you don't have a lot of wall clock time for people to grow into certain mm-hmm. things you need them to get done. On the other hand, uh, a startup isn't necessarily the best place for someone who's done it for 20 years. and just doesn't maybe have the energy or they're a bit too, you know, set in their ways or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've found you need both and you need the right balance. And a lot of this just gets into the team level tactics of how you fill individual slots. A lot of it's about taking bets in either direction and empowering managers and, and directors to, to take those bets and learn from them. And a, a lot of this just ultimately comes from the school of hard knocks, I guess. Um, but, you know, it's, I have really come, and, and I'm biased in this way, I've really come to believe that someone with the motivation and the hunger and the growth mindset the desire to get better and to help others around them be better can do extraordinary things. And Mm -hmm. looking for that, looking for signals, they've done that in the past. And you can find those signals in someone who's coming out of school for their first job. And you can find those signals for somebody who's done this for 30 years to me is probably the, the high bit that we look for more than a particular, you know, technical skill or piece of experience. You've got to temper that, right? I've, I've got a, I don't know, this, this, uh, we have a, a lot of data in Druid, for example, at the moment. And like, there's just a certain amount of Druid knowledge that's awfully helpful at this stage. Uh, mm-hmm. Just, just to give one example, but um, those those cases are maybe less common than than at least I would have thought coming into it. Got it. And as you th- so you th- you mentioned sort of like this blend, right? I'm bringing in more experience, sort of more junior people who can like learn and grow from them. Everybody's got this growth mindset. They've got potential. I've got people at different stages, maybe. Um, Do you think about that at the team level? Like, 
I'm thinking, well, let's pick engineering teams for both yeah. engineering leaders is a good place to start. But like, I or product and engineering R and D, whatever, like a, pro, a product team, we can call it whatever we want. Do you think, oh, okay, what's the like? What does the roster look like right now? Let's go find someone who has, you know, this particular place. Or are you leaning more towards if I bring in lots of good people, I can divide them up and make teams that are going to be great. Um, and, you know, and things will sort themselves out. Like, you're really thinking about what spot is open and what kind of person is going to fill that particular spot really well as part of a team? It's both. I think we've found... For sure, you want to be opportunistic. You you want to, you know, there's, there's NFL people that talk about, you draft the best player on the board when it's your slot like you'll figure it out how they're going to contribute we've tried to do that in a lot of ways so you know for example we've really emphasized uh, more and more rust as our language of choice for a lot of our core infrastructure that we build and we've tried to learn how you can uh, recruit out of that community because there's a there's there's a, a natural affinity and a network effect there. And if you if you tried to whiteboard out the team structure six months out and then identified all the slots, you miss out on so much stuff like that. Mm-hmm. The flip mm-hmm. side though is the thing we found is really important is the rapport between the engineering manager and and the person. People are not mm-hmm. perfect spheres. And you know, every manager has a a, a a different approach, a different personality. And we find that letting that drive a lot of the recruiting, at least in my experience, has worked really well. And and yeah, it gives the teams a different kind of characteristic or personality. And and sometimes you gotta then you know evaluate, okay, there's a thing we want to fill in on the team that that we don't have as much through that natural process. But on the whole, to me it's a better way to do it. And so that's the the Apollo way basically boils down to those two things. We try to get really thoughtful and strategic about recruiting, starting kind of at the sourcing level and just the mapping the landscape level, telling a good story publicly about the company, about the technology. I mean, how many, how many open source companies where you can work on this stuff are there and you get to sit with all these amazing companies that are using it. It's a great starting Mm -hmm. point for a conversation, but then really empowering managers to um, find the people that are going to work best for their team. And getting comfortable with the idea that that's as important as as the theoretical fit with technical skill or seniority or whatever it may be. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm kind of whatever that is. I'm not in that bucket of like, let's just hire like the perfect technical person or whatever, because, you know, your point about growth and leadership. I mean, these things become much more important as you grow through your career and you might find yourself with just someone who has some specific technical experience, but isn't going to, you know, add yeah. anymore. But the, I, I really like the thinking and I, I have, I don't think there's any right answer. You sort of said the Apollo way, which is a great way of thinking about it. Like this is how we've decided to do it. So let's be consistent and see how this works. And maybe we'll change our way over time, but let's at least have a way, right. Versus, well, I don't know, not, which usually leads to a mess when, when you don't have a shared philosophy of, I agree. Yeah, like a manager is going to say, "This is this is the team that I'm going to try to build," or "This is how I think about the team. This is this is who does well on this team. This is who doesn't." Right, and it creates some advantages and some disadvantages. Yeah. Like I think everything in org design is about deciding which things you want to optimize for. Right. Um, yeah. So I, one, for example, would be, you know, can what kind of mobility does that create for folks? Right. Like it's less if if you have sort of more manager specific approaches. And I'm like, you know what? I don't like working on this part of the engine anymore. I want to go work on this, you know, totally different part of the business than an engineering yeah, manager totally. over there might say, oh, maybe that person's not so great for my team, or maybe that's a great growth opportunity. You're going to go do something very different and learn yeah. from someone different. So, um, I, well, you're already agreeing. I'm not sure we, that I had much of a deeper question about that one, but, but I'll how just does say that we work? do with like, teams ha- too, you know, that, you know, mm-hmm. pe- people move teams, but the other big thing we've found is teams have uh, an identity and mm-hmm. there's a working relationship that develops. Uh, we try to keep the mission that a team is focused on pretty flexible. And there's some limits to this, mm-hmm. but 
the, the, you know, teams can, the, the more that teams are themselves agile and can shift from one part of the product to another. And we've found that's super helpful. We've been shipping a lot more cloud-based uh, infrastructure of late, for example, and this vaults in a whole bunch around uh, PLG and, and user onboarding and so on. Our heritage two years ago mm-hmm. was open source that people loved and an enterprise go-to-market that made a lot of sense. So yeah, it's a lot better that we were able to adapt with existing teams, but preserve all of that that you know working relationship and, and the, the kind of team level operating system instead of having to hire from from scratch for a lot of reasons. And that may not work for others. We find it also connects back to the, you know, this this whole philosophy of composability and modularity and what the graph lets you do. We try to live that ourselves. Mm-hmm. And one of the big advantages of that is that you end up needing less specialization on most teams than you might in a more traditional mm-hmm. way of building software. A, a, a team kind of from a technical point of view is some slice of the product, it's got to reach all the way to users. Otherwise, there's no good way to understand the team's productivity and, and like what they're, what they're building. And, and they can't get good at the domain problem they're working on. Um, and it's got to reach all the way back to the end of the stack so that they have ownership and accountability for what they're building. But if you've got that, it means they can, they can actually tackle a lot of different facets of the product. And as the company needs change or as the strategy evolves, you're not faced with this really nasty question of of how you're going to you know jam round pegs into square holes it all kind of lines up pretty nicely and we we just it's like legos it clicks into place in a lot of different and sometimes unexpected ways right right got it well i i'm i'm a fan of the modularity agility um and i, I think that yeah that notion of the team being the unit, right? And therefore being able to move the team around to to experiment in new areas or, you know, focus on things that matter to the business um, is is great if you can if you can make that work. Like there's probably far ranges of skill sets, maybe, that people are like, or or maybe yeah. it's just interest. Like we as a team don't really want to go solve that problem right now. We will if that's what the business needs, but maybe there's a team and that I would just, be better suited and we could, you know. And and I think the other big trend is like less and less is that the case. Like a lot of that kind of stuff you can now buy. Mm, like yeah. think think of all the, you know, yep. we don't have to run Kafka anymore. There's a company that'll give us Kafka by the bite. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's our pitch for the graph to people. And you can get that with databases and you can get that just all up and down the stack. So those yep. those specialized skills can can be brought to bear on the the you know product specific or the company specific work. And I, I think that that's I think I think it's that agility more than maybe the cost savings that's really driving a lot of the adoption of the, you know, infrastructure as a service or the the cloud offerings. Absolutely, I we could spend another hour just on that, but I'm going to keep it focused on teams. So I'm going to make the the transition now to um, I'd love to ask you for our you know our team spotlight. Like, tell me about a team that you've worked on. And we have we have a rule. It can't be your current team. And I know you've been doing this for a long time, so you'll have to stretch. Or maybe you have, maybe you have a sports team on the side that you play on. I don't know. It could be could be anything, right? Uh, but you know, one of the greatest teams that you've worked on. And uh, and tell me how you knew it was great. Like, what was that moment where you were like, "Yeah, this this is awesome. I want more of this." I have been doing this for a while. Uh, I. When I was in college, I joined a tiny little startup in in Boston. Um, it's called Orca Systems. We worked on memory interconnects. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was the kid. Like it, it was maybe 10, 15 people that had a lot of industry experience, uh, a lot of people that had worked on uh, mock and kernels from kind of that era of Unix. And mm-hmm. it It was clear as day the day I joined that I'd gotten really lucky is, is really the thing that comes to mind. It's, it's that um, I, I feel like what I've been able to do with my career in large part started with just a completely lucky moment where I had gone to the career fair at school 
to meet some friends who'd come back to recruit people. I had no interest in working for the big companies that went to career fairs. Mm -hmm. And this guy at the startup literally grabs me as I'm walking by um, and says, you, you look like you do kernel development. I don't know what he was thinking, but it, it was just luck. And, and I think you make your own luck. And I guess I've translated that into, I, I think about people that join our team and realize they're, they're, you know, they should have the same experience. Like mm. we, we can have all this high minded stuff about the right way to build teams, the right way to run companies and product market fit and how you go to market and all this stuff. And it's all true, but we're people at the end of the day. And I, I think if you can give someone that magic when they come out of school or when they find their first like great company that that's run the right way and they can remember that for a long time, you've, you've built the next generation of people that are going to build mm -hmm. amazing stuff. And I think a lot of us do this as much for that kind of reason as it is for the technology and, and the chance to work with, with the customers we do. It's what gets me out of bed for sure. Um, it's, it's just amazing to uh, get a chance to see people flourish that way. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful. It's, it's, it's an experience everyone should have. Yeah. Love it. Love it. The, um, you know, looking back on something that was so helpful to you and, it, and just a great experience and then being able to think about how can I create that experience for others? Right. Like, sure. Yeah, exactly. As you said, we could, could have a very structured framework about and how we think about these bigger picture ideas, but at the end of the day, exactly. it's a very I barely human, remember emotional what experience. I worked on. Yeah, I barely mm -hmm. remember the technology. I mean, I, I could probably jot down some of it. But what I remember is just how it felt. I remember mm -hmm. the camaraderie. I remember the respect, um, the confidence they had in, in, in me as a kid. And that that's the thing that really sticks with you. So I, I just feel like that comes to culture and, and values and what you try to create. and It matters. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Well, I mean, I'm just like happy now. I feel happy. I want people to have that experience. More people, if you're not having that experience right now and you're listening to this, ask yourself what's up. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And that's like, I think that's I right. Even, I don't even know how to ask it. It's like, think about how you want work to feel every day. That's what. That's the question that you should be asking yourself, you know? And uh, we do a lot of it. We all work pretty hard, I'm going to guess. And so, you know, it's a big part of our lives and it should be a great experience, right? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, sure. thanks so much for that. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks to everyone uh, who's listening. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe on your podcast provider of choice. Um, and uh, if there's someone you want us to talk to, you know, find us on Twitter at Circle CI and let us know. Matt, thanks again for joining me. Congratulations on all the success, Paula GraphQL. I think it's a very cool thing and uh, pleasure to have you. Hey, same to you. I enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs>